So um, as many of you know, the talks are about continuous unbroken peace of mind in daily living for Roger or John or Mary, for the human being. It's very easy um, for seeking to become about something um, conceptual. And what do I mean by something conceptual? Um, what I mean is that uh, seeking can become about a concept that we have about what seeking is about that may be very um, disconnected from what I suggest seeking is really about. Um, and so I'll reiterate again that at some point, after being a seeker for many years and feeling frustrated, we'll probably um, have this sort of uh, insight that says, really, my, all I really want is something very practical. I just want to be happy in life. And maybe up to that point in time, we were seeking truth, for example, or seeking enlightenment. Um, and to me, happiness, continuous unbroken peace of mind, is enlightenment. But until that crystallizes, until we really um, see that the two are synonymous with each other, we can easily... Uh, be seeking enlightenment and have an idea about enlightenment, have a concept about what enlightenment is, and in fact be um, aiming in that direction, moving in that direction. And it can be that for very many years we are moving towards a conceptual enlightenment, meaning an enlightenment that is what we think enlightenment is. And some examples um, of those conceptual uh, ideas of enlightenment is um, I just want to know the truth or I am waiting for oneness or union with God or um, all-encompassing bliss for the end of separation for the me or the person to dissolve, for life to become totally impersonal. And what I mean by a lot of these things is experientially oneness, experientially impersonal where there is no sense of a person. So these are all ideas that um, not for... Um, no good reason are in place um, often for seekers uh, it's just part of the seeking process that these um, ideas of enlightenment get put in place as part of the seeking now some of those um, descriptions are valid descriptions of enlightenment, but probably not in the way that we relate to them before seeking becomes about something very practical. Happiness in this life. Now, you might wonder why I spend so much time talking about this, and the reason is that... Um, getting lost in a conceptual idea and therefore a seeking that follows that conceptual idea of enlightenment is so, so common and can remain in place for 40 or 50 years 
or more until the person actually dies for a very good reason and that is because enlightenment seeking is said to be and is quite unusual and that the outcome is um, you know sometimes elusive doesn't happen for everyone in fact we could say that uh, as it's described in some of the old scriptures and and teachings that you know a one in a million might be seekers and one in a million of those seekers will become enlightened so basically it makes it sound like it's pretty elusive and so a seeker can continue to have a conceptual idea of enlightenment and not realize that it's that very obstacle that is making enlightenment elusive the thought is oh it is elusive and so i have the right idea about it i'm pointing in the right direction and because it's elusive it hasn't come so because it is described as elusive we often don't um, question whether we've got the idea of it right or wrong. So um, I have a lot of faith and trust in the fact that um, a lot of seekers nowadays have um, spent a lot of time with the resources available, um, so much on the internet and books available, um, that there's a large group of people that are ready to hear things differently to make it practical so before um, someone would be uh, anywhere near ready to turn seeking into something practical um, what will happen is um, that a lot of beliefs about what life is about get challenged, even if we have the wrong idea about what liberation really is. Um, so with, the, with that idea, because it's so different, um, oneness, God, um, destiny, karma, all of these concepts, um, which all have their place in teachings, and um, I think they can all be explained, but once again, probably not as we um, think of them at first. But because the, the, the seeking and life is described so differently from mainstream thinking, it encourage us, encourages us to see how we have assumed life to be a certain way how we have taken life to be a certain way, primarily because we've been told that that's how it is and this is how we have to live and these are what um, life, these are the important things, this is what life is all about. And we've sort of taken that story on board without really realizing it, maybe, until such time as the story and that way of seeing life just doesn't satisfy, feels uncomfortable, and we're ready to hear anything different. And so we can we then come across um, teachings that say, you know, there is a different way of living life, there is a different um, priority in life, and that part of the problem is that we have believed in certain things that society have told us, and we've believed them to be true, We've interpreted them a certain way and they've got us stuck in a, in a certain movement, um, valuing things that maybe are uh, not as valuable as we have assumed, following those things that we consider to be valuable that may actually be taking us in a direction that doesn't ulti ultimately satisfy. And so once um, that bubble has been burst and we see that yes, we have um, been told by parents, by society, by leaders, by politics, by religion, what life's about and how we should live. 
And when we start questioning this and we start seeing they're just a bunch of concepts and actually I can do it differently. Who says that I have to work a job from eight till five? I can work a job from midnight till six in the morning. It's possible. It just requires uh, an impulse to do it differently to come up. And if we didn't challenge the shoulds and shouldn'ts, um, we may not do it differently. But when we realize that these are just concepts that have been taken on as truth, and um, when we start saying, do I really know that that is where life is meant to be lived from? Is that how my life is meant to look? Now, it might be fine for your brother. That might be what your brother wants. And so even when he challenges or sees the shoulds or shouldn'ts as um, not absolutely fixed, he might still choose to do that, but you might find yourself doing something differently. And so there's a great um, freedom that comes when we see the power of belief, the power belief has over us, the restrictive power that beliefs have over us. So one of the very important concepts that um, is put forward in the teaching is to say that whatever is said, even in the teachings, because often we'll leave society's um, Bible and come across you know, spiritual teachings that basically say don't follow society's Bible because they're all about outcomes and that's not where your happiness is to be found. And so then, and as, as I've suggested, if there's this um, uncomfortableness that has built up from living life that way, where intuitively we feel, yes, this is not telling me, giving me um, true direction, when we feel that, we're very eager to jump off that train onto another train. And then we start relating to the teachings, the wisdom teachings as truth. And if we do that, we might just find ourselves in sort of the same prison as we were in before without realizing it, thinking that we're free. And we might have just jumped out of um, one pot into another pot. Now, it's not exactly that bad. Um, it's just that we have to keep remembering to question what it is that we have interpreted, what, what it is we have come to hold dear, because that might be limited to some extent also. Now, I'm not suggesting that anything that is not true is not valuable. I'm suggesting that all teachings are very valuable and all teachings are concepts and let's not um, relate to them as if they are absolutely the truth um, because that might be what's getting us stuck. So <clears throat> Ramana Maharshi used the example um, or used the analogy. It says, use this thorn to remove the thumb, the thorn that is embedded in your thumb but then be sure to throw both thorns away. And so the thorn embedded in the thumb is a metaphor for an idea, a concept that society maybe has put forward um, or that life has um, ingrained in us that is taken to be the truth. So the embedded in the thumb the thorn represents a concept. The concept could be anything. The sky is blue, the apple is sweet, you should do this and you shouldn't do that. They, they're all concepts. And when we relate to a concept as if it is something absolute, it turns into an embedded thorn in the thumb. Now, I can't think of many reasons why an embedded thorn in a thumb would be a good thing. 
That's why the analogy is there, is that when a concept is turned into the truth, which really means we relate to it as if it's the truth, then it becomes essentially something that needs to be dealt with. And the notion of use this thorn to uproot the thorn embedded in your thumb is saying use this concept to get rid of that concept, but it's not advisable to put this concept into your thumb or let it get embedded in your thumb in place of the old concept. Be sure to throw both thorns away. So that, in my interpretation, is relating to every single statement that you've ever absorbed through your seeking that have been delivered to you from the most high of high teachings or teachers that you've ever um, been exposed to. That is the thorn to remove a thorn embedded in your thumb and then throw <coughs> both thorns away. Now, the reality of the process is that we don't <laughs> remove the embedded concept with the thorn and then throw both thorns away. What happens is we remove the embedded thorn or it gets removed and the other thorn takes its place. It's just the process. And then at some point when there's enough niggling, we realize, oh, there's a thorn embedded in my thumb and we um, start work. It, it starts getting removed by another concept um, that challenges it. So an example of um, a concept that can be used to uproot an ingrained belief is the concept that what I am is not the body. And that would be a concept used to uproot the notion, the deeply ingrained belief that I am the body. And once the deeply ingrained belief that I am the, the body is removed, Inevitably, for a while, the concept, I am not the body, I am awareness, for example, I am formless, will probably take its place. Now, that is not um, a complete disaster, because <clears throat> the previous deeply ingrained um, belief that's been there for our whole life has been challenged. And we've probably started to experience something different. In fact, we might even have experienced the formless aspect of ourself. And if that presented, then the notion I am awareness may not even seem like a concept. We might say, oh, it's not a concept. I know it to be the case. I experience the formless. I am that. And we'd say it's not a concept when I am the formless. It is prior to thinking. I suggest that we throw away the belief I am the body and that I am not the body. You know, we might have um, a deeply ingrained sense of self idea that says, I'm not good enough. 
And so somewhere along the lines, we might be introduced, um, a, a notion in a teaching might be introduced that says, you are perfect. And that's a concept that can uproot a deeply ingrained opposite concept or alternative concept. And ideally, we don't want to end up with the concept, I am perfect. The concept, I am perfect, can maybe cut off the um, thoughts that say, oh, I'm no good because I can't do X, Y, and Z. And the idea that I'm perfect, that you're perfect just the way you are. Someone might explain, you know, you don't have to be good at X, Y, and Z because so-and-so was made perfect in their own way and they're good at that. And you have your own skills and your own capabilities. And you've been designed to be you, not anyone else. You've been designed to be uniquely the way you are. And that might start to, that, that concept that it might resonate with you and you might see the wisdom in it. And that idea I'm perfect might come up in order to cut off the opposite thinking that might have um, been in place for such a long time. And real freedom is freedom from the idea that I am not good enough or that I am perfect. And that movement outside of interconnected opposites intellectual or conceptual interconnected opposites is a place that we may not have spent much time in. Because we've developed um, as a entity that labels and interprets life through language and through intellectual concepts so from a very young age we were told look that's a table and that's a dog and that's a cat and this is mummy and daddy and so we're being taught to see something and think that it is according to the label the apple is red and the cat is sweet <laughs> And so we're almost forced, we, or we are forced, to know ourselves through, am I good or am I not good? I need to be something. I need to label myself as something. And we, might, we don't consciously think this. It's just the way that, you know, that's why we see someone and we have an opinion on it. It's very hard for us to just let things be. So to find this space outside of concept. is uh, pretty freeing. And it requires us to come to focus on the actual awareness of the present moment. What, what does that mean? It means there is if we don't think about the present moment, there still is the experience of the present moment. And you can start off um, looking at it from the point of view of 
uh, the experience that the person is having, which is the seeing, the hearing, the smelling, the tasting, and the touching, and just allow seeing to happen. No need to intellectualize what is seen. Like if you don't call the wall a wall, there is still the seeing of the wall. If you don't call the bird song beautiful or unpleasant, if you don't call it bird song even, you'll notice that there is a hearing without the need to interpret it through conceptualizing, through language, through thought. And that too is bringing attention onto the senses, is where we can start. But I would suggest that what is behind all of the senses is the screen of awareness or the faculty of awareness. And if we question the belief that the seeing is happening because of eyes and the hearing is happening because of ears, which you know might, we might think we have absolute evidence that makes it the truth that eyes and seeing are interdependent on each other and that ears and hearing are interdependent on each other. But when we really question whether we absolutely know that to be true and we see past some of the um, assumptions that says it's true because um, you know science has proved it to be the case um, you know if you look at a night dream um, there is from the perspective of the character in the dream there is seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and it seems like it is happening through the eyes and the ears and if there was a scientist in the dream he would say look it's very clear we've done all the tests and the seeing is happening because of the eyes and the ears and it would it feels to the dream character exactly as daily living feels to you and the benefit of this is to be able to have a first-hand understanding from your own experience of dreams. Oh, the experience of daily life which we have in dreams, when, when we are dreaming it seems like the experience of daily life. And it's only when we wake up that we realize, oh, that was a dream. And without comparing the two, we might say, I don't understand what you mean, that the seeing might not be happening through the eyes or the hearing happening through the ears. But if we use the dream analogy, we might realize that it's all happening in consciousness. It's the dream, the... Um, the body and any of the objects that are seen by the body are essentially a creation, a singular creation, like an imagination in the mind of the dreamer. And all there is is consciousness. And everything is made of consciousness. The sea in the dream, the sand, the deck chairs, the umbrellas are all ultimately made of consciousness, the consciousness of the sleeper or the dreamer. And the sand and the sea, although from within the dream, they all seem very uniquely different. And sand is made of sand stuff and water is made of water stuff and sun is made of sun stuff. But from... An outside perspective, when we look at what a dream is, it is essentially like a night daydream. So if we're daydreaming, we are imagining 
into existence through thought, through the faculty of our consciousness creating a, a, a virtual world. And in dream, in the night dream state, the same is happening as a virtual world is being created inside the consciousness of the dreamer. And the waking state is said to be a mirror down version, or rather the dream is a mirror down version of the waking state. Maybe there just to get us to question the waking state beyond what we would ordinarily. And because a dream is essentially um, this arising, this creation inside consciousness, um, there's a potential for the dream to be experienced from different positions. We may um, have the experience in a dream of being almost like the third person narrator or third person observer um, of what is happening in the dream. Or the dream may be constructed in a way where it very much feels like it is a first person dream and we are the character and know nothing other than life from the perspective of the character. But what's interesting to see is the um, changeability sometimes of things within the, in the dream state. Primarily because they're not um, as fixed as might appear. And in the waking state, if the waking state is observed, questioned, considered, thought about, um, in a particular way, then certain shifts can happen. And so that today's talk is all about dropping outside of thought. And just being with the present moment. And what does that mean, being with the present moment? It means bringing attention onto the fact that there is awareness prior to thinking, prior to labeling, prior to conceptualizing about what is happening in the world. And that um, requires us to question whether it is the body that is aware. We've always felt the experience and assumed that the body is the instrument. Maybe the source of the present moment is more, um, for, the, for the sake of this exploration, it's more accurate to say the source, the subject, is awareness. And that the body is simply an object. The most important um, reason for exploring this is not necessarily to um, know ourself as awareness, but rather knowing oneself as awareness and, and focusing on the notion what I am is awareness in which everything arises rather than I am the body. The reason that we focus on 
I am awareness is that if we find ourselves resting on the dimension of awareness, which means almost like taking a step back and finding ourselves aware of life from a step further back, we'll find that that is a step outside of thought. And that's a great place to live from. It's the place from where we can allow things to just be. It's the place where you have half a chance if you see something uh, controversial in the post of a friend of yours where you can just move on without feeling the need to comment or think about it. It's essentially um, finding out what your business is. See the um, saying or the, the phrase that often sounds quite rude, mind your own business, is really quite apt. It's, we're not interested in our own business. We don't know what our own business is. Our own business is our, our being, our own essence, our own aliveness, not necessarily in a vibrant aliveness, but the very fact that I am, I am in this moment, I exist. And that has become so overlooked that what we think is our business is everything that is going on and everything that everyone's, everyone else is doing and everyone else is thinking. And in fact, our own thinking as well. Our own opinions and thoughts. If we can just find ourselves dropping back into a place where none of that is really my business. Now, this doesn't make us impotent in the sense that if needed, we can still step up and act and engage. And on some level, that will always happen. The biological aspects will continue to function. And certain interactions, um, we could say, are biological, uh, just... Um, not crossing the road when the light is red. That will still continue to happen. And then when the light goes green, the body will move across the road. So it doesn't make us completely impotent. What it means is that when certain um, psychological involvements kick off and there is inevitably an uncomfortableness with that sort of movement, once it's been identified that that is um, optional in a way, that that is the opposite of this allowing, this resting in the, in the space outside of thought, then, then when it kicks off, we realize, oh, I can just come back here. And everything's okay. Even with someone holding a view vastly different from your own. Whereas if we haven't dropped down into this witnessing or place outside of thinking where we know ourselves, right? Uh, sorry, we, not where we know, we don't know ourselves in thinking, but when we drop out of the place of thinking, which is where we have developed into. We're an entity that knows life through thought, through commenting, through opinion. It's a great relief to find this 
space that I'm talking about. To abide in I am was what Nisargadatta Maharaj's guru said, gave, gave to him. That was the gift he gave to him when he was asked, so how should I proceed in my seeking by Nisargadatta? Siddha Rameshwa Maharaj said, abide in I am. And so Nisargadatta followed that advice. It was from his guru. He was a bhakti, so he was completely surrendered and devotional to the guru. So if the guru said, abide in I am, that's what he, he did as his practice. And abide in I am simply means whenever the remembering happens, drop back into, play, into this being, this place of being. And someone might ask, where is this being? And it's outside of labeling, it's outside of judging, it's outside of having an opinion where you just drop back and stop. Now, this movement, the identity is so strong at times that dropping out of the movement of um, defending, resisting, judging, being opinionated, is very hard. It, it just doesn't happen. Um, it, it can't happen. The identity is too strong. But with practice, with a continuous interest or earnestness in abiding in a place outside of being this or that, Essentially, that's what's happening when we stop having an opinion and stop labeling. We find that our conceptual sense of self starts to die. Who am I if I don't take one side or the other? Who am I if I don't um, resist male chauvinism or... Um, who am I if I don't uh, identify with being you know, liberal or democrat or nationalist? And what we find is we find our original self. So don't be dis disheartened if at first it's not available. Because the conditioned self, the conceptual self, the self that has uh, formed itself to need certain things, to be defined by what other people think about us, to be defined by our actions, to define, be defined by outcomes, that's still going to have a, a gravity to it. It's still going to have a substance and a momentum. And if it's never questioned, if we're never looking for our original face, then that other self just keeps getting more and more chiseled away in, or more and more defined. as we become interested in stopping. Not really something that we do, but rather it's about being open to that movement happening. You know, if, if we set out and say, this is what I'm going to do, I am going to stop. I have to stop today for 10 minutes. Then that movement of the doer trying to control and do something is 
actually part of that um, movement of thought. I often wonder and, and marvel over the fact and feel extremely grateful because I just wonder what it must be like for um, to be human without having this place outside of knowing ourself defined by the flow of life, defined by what other people think about you, what we did today whether we were successful or whether we made a mistake or we were rude or someone was rude to us um, essentially often it's our failings um, and and the and when others have certain opinions of us maybe based on our failings if there isn't a place where we can drop out of thought where all of that collapses because really um, someone having an opinion about us is kept alive by, by us thinking about someone having an opinion about us. Okay, so if we drop out of thought, we come back to our original self, which is, ah, oh, here I am. What a relief to drop out of the defending against what someone thinks about us or what we think someone thinks about us and come back to the relief of just being. And so in wrapping up, so we'll go to some questions shortly in wrapping up if you do find yourself open to just stopping and being abiding in i am i used to um the thought i am which is pointing to the fact that even if you've just lost your job which you know circumstantially can be challenging and therefore will have all of these thoughts um that can spiral into um a sense of panic maybe or worry or uh, blame if we just remember if we if we can start to sense that our true nature is not uncomfortableness the uncomfortableness of the thinking mind if we can remember that our true nature does not suffer doesn't feel uncomfortable then when that thinking starts up and there is awareness of the uncomfortableness then there's the motivation to drop back into the place outside of that vortex of what it all means. And we come back to the appreciation, oh, I exist. Even we, we say, oh yes, I've lost my job, but let me not forget, I am. That's so much, I'll deal with the fact that I need a new job. But let me remember, I am, I'm here, I'm alive. There is awareness. And so this I am, um, the abide in I am, often we might not resonate with I am because it has the word I in there. And we've only known I as the conceptual person, the psychological identity. And so I sort of seems like a contradiction to a lot of people. It's like, how can I abide in a, um, the original self and that be I am? Because it might seem like I am means the person with all of their concerns and worries and attachments and whatever. It's talking about the, the true I, the I prior to the psychological um, thinking. And another reason that I am seems like a problem is because we've assumed because it's a 
It's a word, I, that I is conceptual, because words are conceptual. So words are thought-based. And so when we say, I am, the only I that we've ever known is the conceptual I. So we might think this I, abide in I am, seems like you're telling me to abide in, in, the, in thought, in mind. Once we, if this shift happens, so you don't have to call it I am, you couldn't say in what is or in consciousness, in awareness, in existence, in beingness. Whatever word works for you, but what I suggest is that once that works for you, at some point you might register that, that essence that we are, the beingness, has a self-confirming existence, a self-confirming isness, I amness, hereness. I am hereness, not I as something in particular, but it's undeniable. So if you were to close your eyes and sort of drift into meditation, and let's say someone is familiar with resting in beingness, so they're resting in the vastness. And I say, now be very aware of your own awareness and your own presence. And I'm going to ask you a question. And just allow the question to be heard. You don't need to think about it a lot. And allow the answer to be a direct answer to the question. So don't conceptualize the question and come up with a conceptual answer. But allow your experience to answer the question. So you're, you're there in beingness aware of yourself. You might not be aware of your own existence or your own isness, I amness. That's the whole point of this little exercise. But you're there resting in being. And so if awareness of that is there and it's used to answer the question, and the question is, are you dead? And the beingness knows it's not dead. Not intellectually knows it's not dead. It is beingness. It is I am. I am is like I am not dead. <laughs> I am. I exist. <coughs> Now, in that meditative space, when the sense of being an individual person, body, has sort of fallen away, and that in itself requires awareness of the awareness, but the, the sense of I amness is a secondary component of consciousness. So awareness is one component of consciousness. So awareness or consciousness can be conscious or aware of itself. And another facet of consciousness is this I amness, which is a little different. It's not um, a little different from awareness. Awareness f feels very formless and is simply aware. And when awareness becomes aware of itself as I am, that's the second facet of consciousness revealing itself. Ahamsvarana. Ramana Maharshi refers to this Sanskrit um, phrase, Ahamsvarana. Aham is I am. And Svarana means bursting forth. And so when awareness becomes aware of I am, the sense I am, that is the bursting forth of 
I am means awareness has become, or I amness has moved from backstage to center stage, and awareness is now aware of itself, and in particular, the I am aspect of itself. So we'll take some questions if anyone's got any. Peter. Hi, Peter. Hello, Roger. Hi, Peter. Oh, hi. How are you? Well, thanks. And you? So, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, I just uh, I've been actually meaning to ask uh, some questions for some time, but haven't have been missing the uh, satsangs on uh, Saturday morning due to busyness, general mm -hmm. busyness, but. Uh, so I don't know, I have a backlog of questions, but uh, I guess I'll just, one of them is um, been sort of pursuing the idea of, uh, that you raise of, uh, you know, investigation, sort of daily living investigations. I'm just trying to, you know, um, you know, put, put check marks, if you will, next to, you know, identifying, um, these, these, these concepts as they manifest in, in everyday living, such as, you know, just, you know, pain in the moment, uh, pleasure in the moment, um, all, all the, all the concepts we talk about expectations or just sort of tapping into becoming aware of my anxieties and, and various things. Um, and there's, you know, lots of <laughs> different sort of flavors and, uh, that come up and, and one of them that I noticed and I, I, I guess I probably wouldn't have admitted to myself earlier, but now I'm noticing these sort of, um, um, you know, comparing, comparing myself to others and both, you know, and circumstance, circumstances and uh, sort of um, in, in many different forms, you know, it, it comes up as envy, you know, not nothing, nothing very strong, but they're all they're all somewhat subtle. But um, these these feelings come up, um, and I was just wondering, what, what 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 would that be? How would one label something like that? Is that a? It seems to be a combination. I was trying to think: is that guilt? Is that blame? Is that mm -hmm. um, attachment to outcomes? Is it a combination of these things? What 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 is that? Yeah, essentially, <laughs> is it's it a, a sense of uh, well. Yeah. essentially it's um, yeah, it's attachment right. to outcome expectation and attachment mm -hmm. to outcome so what does that really mean because um <clears throat> what you've brought up um here is uh, an investigation into the concepts in the framework and the framework says we're looking for really looking for if we um get down to it in practical terms we want to be happy and happiness is to be found in continuous unbroken peace of mind and what is continuous unbroken peace of mind it's the absence the ending of suffering and in practical terms what is suffering and it's described to be the psychological thinking that is thinking towards circumstance or our attitude towards circumstance and that suffering takes one of five main forms guilt blame pride worry and expectation so it's very important for us to understand which or what each of those look like. So or what each of those re yeah, refer to and look like so that we can start catching the different forms of suffering that arise in our life. So we can then investigate and see deeper as to um, what is supporting it or what is maintaining it. So 
this is a great opportunity, your question, to look at expectation and attachment to outcomes as one of the main forms of suffering um, and, and see it in relation to comparison. So um, as you'll hopefully know, I think based on how you've introduced yourself, it seems like you're fam quite familiar with the, with the teaching. So um, we can split those five forms of suffering into two um, subsets. So guilt, blame and pride is one subset and worry and anxiety, expectation and attachment to outcomes are the other subset. And each um, one of those subsets rests on a particular um, assumption about who we are that is not really very correct. The first um, pillar is I am the doer and the other is the doer. And that is the pillar on which guilt, blame and pride sit. So... Um, in, in brief, just so for those listening, so the, the question or the answer is, is, um, has some substance to it. The belief in personal doership says, I am the one that controls everything that, you know, I do, all of the outcomes and all of the actions and the thoughts. They are my thoughts that are produced by me as a separate, autonomous, independent doer, um, which the teaching suggests is a complete fiction. There is no such um, entity as the doer. There is just the biological and psychological entity, the human being, that has been formed by life. Um, and we call that essentially the, the human being can be uh, labeled or, or described as, or it comes down to the genes and up-to-date conditioning, right? Which is the blueprint that we didn't put in place. We can say God put it in place, but really life put the fact that a sperm and an egg come together and they have um, the makings of the DNA, or whatever, and the, the blueprint is there. And then we start growing amazingly, magically. And as we're growing, we're already in the, in the um, womb, whatever, exposed to conditioning of different sorts. Um, whether it's just, you know, the chemical and, and um, nutritious aspects of um, the womb or maybe even music that the mother plays or stress that the mother might have or joy that the mother might have. And so we develop according to that structure and we continue to develop. Um, we go to school and we are influenced by the subjects that we are presented with, um, the language that um, is spoken in the area we grew up in, the culture, the religious, the whole thing. Um, all of that is conditioning. And we have a particular set of genes, which means we have certain preferences. Our brain um, you know, develops in a certain way that we're good at maths or not good at maths. And so it's suggesting that all of the actions that happen in life are a result of that structure. And so guilt, blame, and pride are based on the idea that I am in control of what I produce, um, what skills I have or what shortcomings I have. And so we feel shame towards our shortcomings and we feel pride towards our specialties or our skills. And we claim ownership over the skills and the good outcomes and we claim ownership over the shortcomings and the, the failings um, that you know society says you should have live up to this standard you should be able to communicate like this you should be able to behave in relationship a certain way and if we don't have those characteristics we feel shame if we don't perform as well as our neighbor if we don't perform as well as our brothers and sisters or up to the standard that our parents would like we feel shame so that's the beginning of comparing we, we compare outcomes and then we feel shame if we don't achieve the outcomes or we compare ourselves to certain benchmarks and um, what the neighbor has got etc and if we outperform we might feel pride um, so the guilt blame and pride is based on the idea i 
um, am in control of how successful or how unsuccessful I am. Um, and if we can surrender to the fact that we're essentially <coughs> a very complex biological robot or biological organism, you know, I, Ramesh used to use the word robot because it makes us, it, it's easier for our understanding, for our intellect to understand that a robot is essentially forced to act according to certain parameters. So if I say we are a biological organism, our intellect says, oh yeah, that's an aut autonomous entity. Um, whereas when we say a biological robot, it becomes more obvious that we are essentially forced in each moment to function one way that seems like it is not um, constrained by factors, it feels like it's not constrained by factors, but when we really think about it and look at it, we see that those things that feel like my doing are essentially outputs of this biological instrument. Okay, so we've got rid of guilt, blame, and pride, but we can see how that um, can be triggered by comparing. So now let's look at what I suggested, the real cause of um, suffering in relation to comparing is, and that is expectation and attachment to outcome. Expectation and attachment to outcome is a form of belief that we have about who we are that says, <clears throat> in order for me to be valid, happy, complete, whole, um, I require outcomes to be a particular way. So essentially it is a belief that says my happiness, my completeness, my worthiness is dependent on outcomes. So that's what attachment to outcomes really is saying. And so if we have a deeply ingrained belief that says my who I am is determined by and defined by my successes and my failures, then that means that um, we're going to feel inflated by success and deflated by failure. And what I mean by inflated and deflated on a level of self, so because that's the idea we have is that says my sense of self, who I am, is added to or co is completely determined and interdependent on outcomes. Um, and with that deeply ingrained belief, and it's something um, very important about those words, deeply ingrained, we, don't, we might not really appreciate how the process of genes and up-to-date conditioning, essentially the new conditioning that comes, um, is delivered to us by life, moment after moment after moment that turns into what we can call our up-to-date conditioning is so relentless and repetitive that the beliefs that form unconsciously are so deep that they create a psychological sense of self. Um, and it's that psychological sense of self if it feels defined by outcomes is continually going to be judging outcomes is continue continually going to be looking for itself in the flow of life which is in the flow of outcomes in the flow of circumstance and that is the very epitome of the lack of freedom that is um, where we can't be free because we are completely at the mercy of outcomes uh, because that's the sense of self that we um, that's been put in place, and that is the conceptual sense of self. It's what can be referred to as the psychological sense of self, and it what it's what can be referred to as the false sense of self. What we aren't really, but what we think we are, and a dropping out, which is what today's satsang was all about. Dropping out of that um, highway, dropping off that highway into a knowing of our self prior to the conceptual self, prior to the psychological self, is where freedom can be found because we 
may live in a street where <clears throat> everyone is successful and we see all the um, houses <clears throat> that people have and the cars and the families and we might find ourselves continually judging ourselves, comparing ourselves, feeling shame or maybe the opposite, feeling pride because we might be the one with um, you know, the house and the car and everyone else doesn't have it. Whichever it is, we might have this um, sense of self based on outcomes. And I'm suggesting that there's an inherent uncomfortableness and lack of satisfaction knowing yourself and trying to find happiness there. And so if that's registered, then it gives us the motivation to return home more and more regularly. And this returning home is returning to the place where we drop out of comparing and using that as a judge as a, a benchmark as to whether we're good enough or not, because ultimately it, we're doing that because we think that that's where our happiness will be found in being better than someone else or achieving something. Um, so if you see that happening, which believe me is, you know, that's the human condition, right? Um, so you're not, not alone. The important part is to see it happening. And as, as we see it happening, we can then start putting the ticks next to it going, yes, that is um, the psychological sense of self running wild. And it does take me down a path where I can feel depressed of uh, not having achieved something or I can feel proud. And um, when we feel pride, we might notice how we don't respect others that haven't maybe achieved what we've achieved we might feel, you know, we feel superior, we lack compassion, and we might start judging themselves, judging the others and saying, you know, you don't get anywhere because you don't work hard. Um, or, you know, I can't believe that, you know, those are your priorities. Or So we start to see this, and we realize that there's a lack of love, a lack of acceptance, a lack of harmony, um, and a lack of seeing perfection in the diversity. Uh, and so once that starts to become clear that that isn't a place where I'm nourished, then this, this movement to drop out of that becomes, um, you know, th there's more motivation for, for that to happen. Yeah, <clears throat> wow, thank you for that comprehensive answer. Um, yeah, it just it makes me realize just how in, deeply ingrained <laughs> as much as I as much time as I expose myself to this teaching and um, in particular others as well. But um, yeah, because I those um, uh, you know nothing you said now was was news or <laughs> unfamiliar to me. But it's it's almost like a, it's almost like a mantra. It's a, a reminder which is, is very helpful because, um, mm. yeah, it does, you do, it, you do have a tendency to keep getting lured back in, I find. But, uh, well, thank you very much, Roger. Really appreciate it. You're welcome, Peter. Yeah. I, I do suggest, so I'll, I'll move on to another questioner, but yeah. I do suggest that um, that is one of the mantras, so to speak, one of the key concepts that can keep coming up for ourselves. Not that we just repeat innately but that we remember from time to time especially when we see ourselves caught in a certain type of um, uncomfortableness like expectation or comparison which is my happiness is not to be found in the flow of life you know what it's really reminding us of is who i am already exists i am and we just need to come back so my happiness isn't to be found in the flow of life is sort of just a, an antidote to the judgment of ourself or the judgment of others. And we come back to this place that is outside of thought and just rest there maybe for two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. And eventually it becomes the place that we can move from. Hi, Martin. Uh, 
Hi, Walter. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. And you? I'm great. Thank you very much. Good, good. Um, my question is as follows, and it ties in in a way to what's just been asked. I've been finding myself lately to be really obsessed about certain things in my life. And as I've been exposed to teaching for years now, it kind of is curious to me that it still appears in such a strong way. It's almost as if I'm ready to bargain with the teaching. It's almost as if I say this is just a cop out. And if people really knew how wonderful 10 seconds of immense pleasure can be, they would trade everything they have for that feeling. My question is, how can I suit myself in these moments? Because peace of mind seems so unattractive to me at that time, because I'm so immersed in my obsession. Mm -hmm. And it really, it's so funny is the wrong word, because it's not so funny. But it's almost as I'm willing to make a devil a, a devil's bargain, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd really be happy to um, have you talk about this. And I hope I've said enough to for you to share something. Mm. Well, when um, suffering is very when suffering is very strong at times when it's very strong, um, it's a feeling right that comes over us. And it's not our doing. It is essentially the the functioning of um, everything in that moment, um, and that might include the or that does include our particular makeup, our genes, and up to date conditioning. And if attachment to outcome, the belief of attachment to outcome, is very strong, what it's what is really the the narrative, the song that is being played on a feeling level um, is I need chocolate or I need love, I need money, um, I need appreciation. That's w whichever one of those it is or, or the combination of all of them. And it isn't a thought. Um, I'm not talking about just some thought oh i need chocolate i'm talking about the thought in its very condensed form such that it is a deep feeling of craving um so craving is essentially um a word you know that points at a feeling that says i need that so you're right we will feel like i would almost do anything for it you know, you um, even, you know, it's going to uh, contribute to ill health, maybe even kill me. Doesn't matter. I need it. <laughs> and um, essentially, that's what addiction is. Um, it's a deep sense of needing something. Uh, and so when it's there, there isn't really a solution for it um, because it is the manifestation of one's genes and up-to-date conditioning at that particular point in time. Um, so if the attitude towards it can be as I've described, then at least there might be an understanding of what's happening and even a surrender to what is happening because there's really no point in struggling against it because what I'm describing is that the feeling is the manifestation of what is in that moment. Now, that doesn't mean that that is going to remain, you know, and be the same in a week's time or in a month's time, but in that moment, it is the manifestation of the genes and up-to-date conditioning. Um, the engagement in the teaching when you are not suffering essentially is and hopefully is affecting your up-to-date conditioning so there is new conditioning coming in um, in this case in the form of the teaching and that new conditioning 
is becoming part of your up-to-date conditioning, which means it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to stop those moments from happening, as you well know, because you've been engaged with the teaching for a long time and these feelings still happen. Um, but it is having an effect, not necessarily the effect we might um, think it should have, but by default it is having an effect. Uh, and the effect usually is cumulative, and what you might find is that there are less times where that um, where the suffering uh, arises, or you might find that the suffering is less intense, doesn't sound like it based on um, you know, your description of the particular suffering you're talking about, or it gets cut off um, quicker than it did before, or maybe after this explanation, there is a surrender to the suffering, which might not mean the suffering goes away, but there isn't a secondary resisting of the craving because it might be seen in the future as simply an output of the genes and up-to-date conditioning in that moment. And if we can understand that surrender is actually um, probably the most useful um, movement in terms of addressing that, we often think that um, surrender is not getting us anywhere and that's why we resist the suffering. We resist the suffering because we think, unless I do something like resisting it, it's not going to get better. And it's ironic that it's completely the reverse, a surrender to it and just allowing it to be there as a result of God's will, as a result of your genes and up-to-date conditioning, something that is out of your control, something that is inev inevitable, is completely counterintuitive to what we would normally do. And I suggest it's about, it's leaps and bounds ahead of any other movement uh, that could happen. Thank you for this comment. I'm, I'm really, really touched because surrendering is something that has come up as well as a theme in my life, so it really fits. And I guess because it's touching, it um, you made a point that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. Do you think that my fear of surrendering to the addiction because I think that I believe that once I surrender to the addiction, it will become worse. Like mm -hmm. I'll act out, I'll do the thing I, I don't want to do. Is that just another manifestation of my so-called ego? Uh, it's, it's essentially a concept that you have. And I'm sure we've all had um, examples of concepts we've had that are wrong or that aren't accurate. Um, so it's not certain that the concept is wrong, but there's a fairly good chance that the concept is wrong because we carry a lot of wrong concepts. Um, and, uh, you know, for some people at least, surrendering to addiction is going to be very beneficial and there is exactly the fear you've um, brought up which is we are petrified of surrendering to the addiction because we assume that our resistance is the only thing keeping us somewhat sane or or out of trouble or from sliding into complete despair and it might be that that is not the case. It might be that conscious surrender means a whole lot of awareness. Like if you, if you got to the stage where there is a surrendering to the craving in such a way that while the surrendering is happening, you know that there is a surrendering. You are aware of the surrendering which means you may 
um, let's say we're talking about food, um, you may then go, I've surrendered to it, so I'm just going to eat three, three boxes of biscuits. Um, now, I think that there'd be a great awareness of the eating of the three boxes of bis biscuits because you've surrendered to it, and I'm, I'm suggesting that actual, the act of surrendering means an act of great awareness um, because you don't just surrender. You surrender after, let's say, this has become an, a big issue that you're thinking about, then you ask a question, you get an answer, and at some point the craving might come up down the track and then there is a, a decision to do something different to what you normally do. And the, what we normally do tends to be to resist it and we often find even the resistance is futile because we end up doing um, what, you know, engaging in what we crave even if there is an intention to resist it. And so we might say, hey, what if I do it differently? What if I just surrender to the craving and indulge in whatever it is I crave without resisting, but with a, an allowance, with no guilt, for example, because surrender means no guilt. Surrender means an allowing the movement, understanding you're being lived and it's futile to resist it. And who knows what the outcome is going to be. Now, I'm not suggesting this to everyone, so um, I, I don't know who I'm suggesting it to. Um, so if you have a huge addiction problem, then speak to a professional that knows your situation. Uh, but... I am suggesting it to those people that it resonates with to consider doing things differently and make sure that there is an awareness of the surrender and the indulgence, if that happens, and the consequences of that. And if that's done with an awareness of what is happening, the biological movements, the psychological movements that are happening, um, doors may very well open up. Thank you very much. I'm satisfied now and happy and wish you a very pleasant evening. Thank you so much, Roger. Thanks, Martin. Hi, Jahira. Hi. Hello. So, um, do you, are, do you, uh, um, I'm sorry, maybe you don't want to be compared to other non dual teachers, but you know how they say, some people say like, there's no you. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you say that? Do you see there's no you? Um, well, the, the, that's, that's valid um, when we understand what it's really pointing at. Um, and it's so easily misunderstood. I've, you know, you just need to go onto non-dual chat sites and there's a huge amount of confusion. So I prefer not to say <clears throat> there is no you. Um, I, I do say there is no doer and that was the teaching that Ramesh used to put forward so he'd say there is a Roger and a Ramesh and a Jahindra um, but there is no doer as, as in there is no separate individual doer that is independent and separate from life um, which really means in practical terms if we talk about it from a down-to-earth point of view, it requires us to see that the speaking is an output of this body-mind organism, Roger. And where did Roger come from? Now, our psychology tends to sort of draw a line um, in each moment and creates a sort of separation 
of this moment from anything that happened in the past. And so then we say, these words are my words. And when I say, when we say that, these are my words, we tend to mean me as a separate, autonomous, independent doer that is in control of what I say and how I say it and when I choose not to say something. And so that creates this um, essentially idea of someone driving the bus. You know, like if the, the picture of the uh, human being with a man in, in, the, in the head area controlling everything. And that man or woman, the person in the head area controlling, is a figment of our, our imagination, really. What there is is a, is a structure, an organism, and that organism functions according to the circumstance that it is in, and it will function exactly according to its design. And so when we, if we start to appreciate this, we, we can have an epiphany and we go, there really, there isn't anybody here, as in, um, and, or we can say, I don't exist. And what we're really saying is the I that I thought existed, the me that I um, always had as an idea, is popped. It's like, oh, there's just life happening, and speaking is happening, and thinking is happening, and I'm not doing it. In fact, it's, I don't exist. And so when that, when that realization happens, um, <clears throat> a lot of seekers that have that realization will go around saying, there is no me, there is no person. Um, there, there's just life happening. Uh, and the depth of the realization and the, more importantly, the depth of the integration um, is going to be dependent usually on time because over time the nuance and um, what actually still remains then starts to be seen and, and we can then start catching out the, the, the concept and we start saying, well, that's not exactly right. I do exist, but I exist as part of life. I exist as a, a conditioned and specifically designed instrument. Um, and so we can then say, oh, well, the person does exist. Roger does exist, but he's not separate from life. Um, Roger does exist, but he's not the doer of um, his thoughts and his actions. Now, that doesn't mean that I think that I can go around you know, breaking things up and not suffer the consequences. So the fact I'm not the doer doesn't mean that the body, the body-mind organism won't suffer and the consequences, um, both positive and negative. So there will be rewards for those actions that happen through me that are useful to society. And there will be punishment for those actions that happen through me that are not helpful for society. And so um, an integration... Um, which means separating out all the levels and understanding, um, you know, how it all how it all holds together without getting too confused and without taking a concept too far is, to me, part of the integration process that happens after various insights. Like there is no me as I previously thought existed. Okay, yeah, so um, I kind of like, I kind of visualize it as like one ocean, right? Like one big soup, like we're all part of this, we're all in this one big soup together. Mm -hmm. um, is that kind of it? <laughs> um, well, like there's, there's no separate parts, it's all just one, it's all energy, you know, it's all... We look, we, we appear to be moving bodies, but it's actually just energy that appears that way, almost like a simulation or... Uh, yes, that, I mean, 
it's yes and it so there's a lot of different ways and so someone will have an appreciation of everything being consciousness um so uh, you've described everything as energy which is more um if we if if a scientist um explained the unicity of life they would um probably explain things on a molecular level and you know say on a, or on, a, on an atomic level there is just a soup of um atoms and then on a subatomic level um we go beyond the level of atoms to something even more homogenous uh and someone so you can understand it that way um one of the most um powerful i think um seeings is to see everything as consciousness rather than energy because energy um tends to be uh a little intellectual in a sense because we can be told that the wood is energy and the water is energy and we can imagine it and almost get a sense and and sort of see beyond the form and because we understand it intellectually we might start to think oh i um know it i know the wood as energy and i know the metal as energy and i know the water as energy but really what what's happened is we've understood a concept and we're now in a way seeing the wood we're seeing past the wood the form of wood but we're not really seeing the energy but we think we we might think we are mm-hmm. and but that allows it allows our experience of the wood and the water to change um somewhat even if we aren't um directly experiencing energy or molecules or subatomic um molecules so there's a limitation to that um then so someone else might then say oh what i see the non separation because i see that a leads to b leads to c leads to d and i see that the speaking right now is a result of the big bang right and there's no separation um and once again that's a little intellectual although i think it's it's very powerful um because it means that our thinking has gone past the separation view and is now stitching together things that weren't stitched together so the big bang happened and everything is a ripple from the big bang and that means they're not separate um so we've stopped seeing events as separate and we're sort of now seeing them as one big event um and so the notion that life is predetermined um tends to follow that thinking that um a leads to b leads to c leads to d and actually that they're just one big block of a b c d which isn't really a and b and c and d it's just the block um now consciousness is something that is available that is here right now and the whole experience of life um when we stop looking at um the experience as being a subject object relationship meaning a person a body aware of a table that is outside of it if we if if that's the the presupposition when we observe daily life that there is a a body subject and a table object that seeing essentially creates um an unappreciation of the underlying fabric of consciousness um and so if that notion of a body subject and a table object falls away and we realize that both the body and the table are objects 
and that the true subject is neither of those objects. That can be part of um, a shift that will allow us to appreciate that the present moment is really an appearance in consciousness and potentially a virtual world. Um, and it's palpable. It's, it's not just... A, um, it doesn't have to remain just as a concept that this might be like the matrix, right? That, that's a concept. This might be like a matrix. But it can be experienced because the very thing that is aware of the table and the body is consciousness and <clears throat> it requires us to question the the tableness of the table you know is just because the table is experienced as wood does it mean it is wood um and <clears throat> you could say the same you could say well that's no different to just because the table looks like wood is it wood because actually it's energy um the consciousness, though, is what we are. So we can experience um, or we can become aware of the table as just an image in consciousness, in, inside what I am. And so a lot of awakenings that non-dual seekers have are, is an awakening to that. And the big objection that they would have is... Uh, when someone says, you know, you're just uh, perpetuating a concept that there is, um, that life is a dream, um, whereas in the awakening, it's felt experientially and it's, it's recognized directly. And it seems like that's the truth. The problem is that we tend not to be very educated at, at questioning what that new experience is really proving to us because it doesn't necessarily prove that um, there is no body for example but it feel it it shows us a different side of life um, and it allows the oneness to be more appreciated so um, yeah i think what you've described is is on the right track but i would switch over to consciousness rather than energy and know that you are the consciousness in which everything arises, of which everything is made, and from where everything is witnessed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, just one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, that was a lot. So, um, okay, so... Because you say that I'm not the doer. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm not the doer and then I go ahead and consciously decide to, like you said to the last gentleman, um, notice my resistance and practice detachment. So am I just pretending then? I'm just pretending that I am the doer in that moment when I say, okay, I am doing detachment right now. I'm sure you've had a question similar to that before, right? Uh, yeah, well, even even that wouldn't be your doing. It would be a happening. Because um, I suggested that to a question, right? So the question was um, part of the circumstance. And okay. that that happened according to the, the questioner's um, genes and up-to-date conditioning, which included their circumstance that inspired the question. Okay. Um, so then if you find yourself um, with the thought that says, uh, witness the craving, for example, and maybe mm -hmm. witnessing okay. the craving even leads to the craving being fulfilled or the body moving towards its desire then even that thought that comes up that says witness the craving is not is not an individual doer's doing but a happening as part of the unfolding of life based on you know new conditioning that became part of your up-to-date conditioning yeah i get it i think i get it 
Mm. Yeah. So but that's why I said like it's like I'm pretending almost, but it's it's not that I'm pretending. It's just that it's just happening. Yeah, just you're. Happening. A, you'd only be pretending if you um, are still thinking there is a doer saying, uh -huh. "Let let me be detached from the craving." So if you can see okay. all of your thoughts are not really uh -huh. your thoughts. Um, yeah. All of your thoughts happen. And when they happen, there yeah, is awareness yeah. of them. So you only know them after they happen. And yet after, yeah. they, after they happen, we say, oh, I, I did that. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird because I think that, like you said before, like I feel like since they're, <clears throat> you can't see my thoughts, that I just assume that they're mine, but they're just happening quietly, just somewhere, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, even if we, yeah. if we, because that's why that's why we think that I'm driving the bus because, like, you can't see my driver, or I perceive that you, you know, I can't see your thoughts. If, you know, yeah. you can't see mine. The thing is, they're we invisible. can't we can't and, even see our own. But driver. I don't own them; they're just happening. Right, right. We can't see our even our own. Yeah. Yeah, because so <laughs> what we see is the output. If you look at the thought, we've mistaken the yeah. thought as the decision making process. Whereas I, I'd suggest mm -hmm. that the, the decision making process is a whole lot of um, synapses firing. And um, I don't know what what um, I'm trying to think of the chemicals, um, Yeah, various chemicals and synapses. Like brain chemistry. Yeah, all of that. And the thought is after all of that. And so we see the thought and we so we say, oh, that's why I decided to go on holiday in July um, because of my thinking about it. <laughs> Whereas actually it was because of a whole lot of brain chemistry that you didn't do. Um, and the thought is just a sort of decoy to make us th um, have something to claim as being mine and being what created the action. Whereas I think the thought is already an output um, of a machine. Yeah, because that would be free will then. To, that's what that is. Like you have the, you make the decision in your head to do this or that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so at first, um, because we're hammering home, just this is just to, to throw a curveball in. Um, at first, because we're hammering home this notion of non-doership, um, simply because it is what is very much responsible for that assumption, which I suggest is false, is very much responsible for a lot of human suffering. Right. So um, this teaching really hammers home you are not the doer, which in, in the initial sa stages we'd say, you have no free will because free will and doership, um, uh, we could say are synonymous with each other for a period of time because the, the difference between them is so nuanced. It's too nuanced for it to be effective for us to separate them initially. So we sort of say you have no free will because everything is God's will. Um, and that's said because we're working on one side of the coin, which is to break down the belief, I am the doer, I am in control. Um, and so we say, look, there is no free will. You have no free will. Everything is happening according to God's will. Um, and then further down the track, We'll say you have free will in the moment to do exactly what you think or feel to do. However, knowing that what you think or feel to do is a result of your genes and up-to-date conditioning, which you weren't in control of. Um, and when Ramesh said this to me, I said, so that means I don't have free will because everything I do is a result of factors I didn't have control of. And he'd say, Roger, mm -hmm. you have free will in the moment to do whatever you think or feel to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, well, I don't get it because you spend most of your time telling 
me that I'm not the doer and everything I do is a result of my genes and up-to-date conditioning. And then when I say, so therefore I don't have any free will, there is no free will, he'd say, no. He says, no, Roger, you have free will in the moment. And so I couldn't get my head around this. I was just getting confused, thinking, so we have apparent free will? And he said, well... Like I said, pretending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he said, well... Sort of. No, you have free will. So what it is, is his definition of free will um, is very specific, um, which is, and the reason for it is that if we go, if we see we're not the doers, which is the most important part, right? We need to see that because um, we've lived our whole life convinced we are the doers feeling shame for all the things that have gone wrong, feeling pride for all the things that have gone right, blaming and hating the others for everything they've done, right? All of that based on the notion I'm the doer and the other person's the doer. If that falls away and we see it's all God's will, then you know the fact that I failed grade five and had to repeat it was God's will. Um, the fact that I did really well in grade five, came top of the class, that was great. That was God's will. Um, whichever of the two, we can sort of, it's in the past and we hand it over to God. We don't have to keep carrying around this load of guilt and blame, blame towards the other for what they've done to hurt us, let's say, or how they let us down. All of that can fall away. Um, but then what can happen is we go around after a very significant realization saying, you know, I have no control. I have no choice. Um, because that sort of makes sense, right? If, if we see that we're not the doer, then we go around saying, everything is God's will. I have no control. I have no choice. And that, in a way, becomes a concept that um, overpowers or covers up what's actually happening in life in practical terms. And that is that in practical terms, when you're hungry, you go to the fridge, you open the fridge up, and you look in the fridge, and there is the feeling of free will, meaning um, you don't feel like you're not in control. You don't feel like you don't have any choice. In fact, you look at the fridge, and you go, I'm free to pick whatever I want. Um, and if we don't appreciate that and um, switch into the, the actuality of life, what happens is a realization of one side of the coin then becomes a concept or a belief that um, gets applied to both sides of the coin. And it's only applicable to one side of the coin. Um, so in practice, what we want is to... <clears throat> essentially have surrendered to the fact that life is God's will and in the moment feel like I'm completely free to choose whatever I like, which is our experience. Um, and that's a flowering of the paradox, um, which is very pertinent for some people at a certain point in time, especially if they've deeply understood I'm not the doer, they might have understood that, it might have had a great effect, and yet they might not realize that that concept is preventing them from appreciating a freedom in the moment, or at least a feeling of freedom in the moment that's very precious. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I do understand, because then it can be kind of like a nihilism, you know, they, you know, well, if I'm not the doer, then fuck it, you know, like, fuck everything, kind of. But yeah, I do, I get it. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Roger. You're very welcome. You've actually nailed it on the head then. Um, so the I'm not the doer, essentially, is always a, a, to be applied on an attitudinal level. On a practical level, we have to function as if we are the doer. And the I'm not the doer is what is needs to be applied to the past and to the future. Um, and 
in the present, we need to act as if we're the doer. Thank you so much. Mm, you're welcome. Okay, I think that's about it for today. So, oh, I did um, want to mention just for people to consider, um, I'm contemplating the notion of um, holding a couple of uh, online intensives, probably uh, starting in a couple of weeks' time. So there'll be probably six days, consecutive days, two hours each day um, on a particular topic. Um, so one topic might be doing exactly what you feel like um, and exploring that. Another one might be abiding in I am. Another one will be looking at the notion of uh, non-doership and attachment to outcomes. So um, that's just me thinking off the top of my head. Um, so that's three intensives, six, six days, two hours each day, same time each day. Um, and it'll probably be in the morning for those in the US and also the morning for those in, in Europe, which would be, um, oh, sorry, evening in the US, uh, which would be my morning. And uh, morning for those in Europe, which, which would be my afternoon. Um, so keep an eye out. I'll probably mention it again next week, but it's something for you to um, consider. Uh, ahead of time. Uh, there'll only be about uh, 10 to 15 people, I think, in each um, group. So the aim is for me to be able to interact um, with the participants um, more. There'll be a charge associated with it. Uh, it'll be under $200, I would say, for the six days. Um, so I'm going to try and keep it affordable. Um, it's just a way that I can supplement uh, my income and make sure I can keep providing the um, the online satsangs uh, for free. So um, for those that feel compelled, I'll put more details up in the next uh, next week or two. Thank you. Peace. <laughs>